Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Patrick DeGlaris. I am the past president of the Oklahoma Archivists Association. Um, and I'm happy to be moderating this first workshop of our summer series um, between July and August. We'll have three different wonderful workshops from practitioners around the state. And today I'm happy to introduce Samantha Schaefer, who will be talking about preparing rolled panoramic photographs for storage and conservation. Um, as I mentioned previously, this is being recorded. So um, we will have a question and answer time at the end. That won't be if you wanna save any questions then, but um, Samantha will be demonstrating different things throughout the workshop. So please feel free to ask questions um, for clarity uh, throughout. Um, so I uh, will briefly mention the other two workshops just for some shameless promotion. Um, on July 26th, there will be a workshop on pro project management in the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Study Center. Um, registration for that is free and, and available if you haven't already. And then August 9th, there will be a workshop led by Jennifer Green on preservation housing for paper collections. So if you're really interested in this topic, that one will be another great one to jump into. Um, you can find registration for both of those workshops on our website. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Samantha Schaefer, who will be leading this workshop. Um, she is the archivist too for the Dickinson Research Center at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. She earned a BA in English Literature with a minor in Anthropology from the University of Arkansas and a Master's of Library Science from the University of North Texas. She is passionate about privacy ethics and equitable description in the archives. She works under guiding principles of archival accessibility and approachability. So without further ado, Samantha, take it away. So hello everyone and thank you, Patrick. Um, like you said, I am Samantha Schaefer. I'm at the Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City. Um, and I put my contact email on the handout that Patrick sent out to everyone earlier. So if you have any questions after this or you think of something you didn't ask, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk shop. Um, so that being said, just as kind of a warning, I'm going to be jumping between my PowerPoint and kind of like a live demo. So if there's ever any camera issues or you can't see something clearly, please throw it in the chat or raise your hand or just let me know because I want to make sure that everyone can see everything. So that being said, let me share my screen. And we'll get started. So here we go, preparing your rolled uh, panoramic photographs for storage and future conservation. Um, so unfortunately, it, this is all about storage and outsourcing your conservation. I am not skilled enough to do that on my own, nor do I work in a place with the equipment. Uh, but I'll give you a little background on that as we get started. So this whole knowledge building I did about storing rolled panoramas uh, came about because Currently, the DRC uh, put together an exhibition at the Cowboy Museum. It's up right now through October, so a little nut, some more shameless self-promotion, um, about panoramic photographs. Uh, it's called Wide West, and in it, we display some of our already flattened uh, panoramic photographs along with some of the rolled ones. And when we were proposing this exhibition, um, the previous director of the museum and myself originally started out working on this project together. And we included a budget item in that exhibition budget for conservation work, because we knew we had undiscoverable rolled panoramic photographs. Um, and we knew we didn't have the equipment or the skills in house to do it. So we wanted to be able to get some of those items conserved. So after some research, we ended up submitting our rolled panoramic photographs to the Northeast Document Conservation Center, the NEDCC, um, to have them conserved. But um, the NEDCC is very picky about how you send things to them. And according to their website, if you don't send it to them in the exact right way, uh, they'll send it back without even looking at it or giving you like a proposal or you know an, a cost estimate. So. These skills and this presentation was born out of some very frantic research of how do we ship these, how do we store these in a way that they will make it safely, the NEDCC won't reject them, and we can actually get some flattened. 
So you are reaping the skills of my like panicked uh, last minute of research here. So here we go. So there are kind of four parts that I've broken this down to into this sort of project. So first part, obviously, is assessment. You've got to see what you've got, what's going on with it, how stable are they, what kind of condition are they in. Um, after that, you have to consider your preservation. Um, how are we going to work in-house to keep these things as stable as possible? What preventative measures could we take in-house with what we've got? Um, then you'll consider storage. How am I going to store the things that aren't going to be sent out for conservation um, for a long-term period of time? And then finally, how do you safely ship these things? Because we've all heard the horror stories about, you know, um, and I've seen it here occasionally, like art or something gets shipped and the container is not sturdy enough and the hole gets punched in it and your object is damaged. And nobody wants that. Like that's the antithesis of what we're doing here. Um, so that being said, we'll start with assessment. Now assessment, it's all about the spreadsheet. We're archivists, it's always all about the spreadsheet. Let's be honest here. Um, so you wanna create a master inventory of your rolled panoramas. Um, it doesn't need to have a ton of information, but it does need to include the accession number of your object or some sort of identifying number if it doesn't have an accession number, uh, the collection name, if it's known, and dimensions. How tall is it? What's the, I have circumference, but should be diameter, uh, obviously not a math major, but how, how wide is it for future packing purposes? Um, you also want to assess any damage to the object and how flexible is the object. Um, so for example, this one I have here, uh, it, it's pretty sturdy. There's no, um, there's no crumbling on the ends. Uh, there's no obvious kind of cracks on the photo itself. Um, and if I was, I heard something, okay. If I, if I was assessing it uh, for potential mail out, I would also see how difficult it would be to unroll. Um, so this one, it's rolled pretty tightly. It's not very big here, uh, which is kind of a, a red flag because the tighter it's rolled, generally the more stiff it is. And you can see like there is not a lot of give in that. Um, and so I can barely get it, you know, unrolled this much. In comparison, we have this one, which is a little bit wider diameter here. And it's still pretty stiff, but I can can unroll it a little further without feeling like it's going to crack. So if if having to make the choice between the two, I'm going to pick the smaller one because it's in closer danger of potentially cracking or being damaged if say in the future I'm not here and someone who doesn't know about this goes to look at it and is like oops um so trying to prevent that so here is an excerpt from the spreadsheet we created when doing our original assessment um so you can see that we included a storage location so which box it got packed in for shipping um we had seven boxes uh, we included the accession number and the collection name if we knew it. In some cases, obviously, we did not, and how tall it was. And let me drag a screen over. I also have this. Can everyone see the spreadsheet? I'm assuming if nothing pops up in the chat, <laughs> we're good. I can uh, see the slide. I don't see uh, a separate spreadsheet. Okay. Um, I won't. I won't worry about it. Um, so my recommendation here is that you have a master sheet of your inventory, and then I would do separate sheets for each individual box as well. And you can just copy and paste that information over, but having that information sorted out, especially if you have several hundred spreadsheets, it makes it a lot easier to go into the specific box you're working with and manipulate that information only without potentially messing something up in a different place. Um, so for example, my spreadsheet actually has eight tabs. So there's one that's like the master list and then box one through box seven, all have individual tabs as well. So once your assessment's done, um, I would also recommend assessing the collection that these items are in. So for us, when it came time to set priorities, we wanted to pick items that were not rodeo photographs because 
the majority of our already flattened panoramic photographs are rodeo photographs. And so we were trying to expand our subject matter a little bit, you know, kind of fill in, potentially fill in gaps in our collections. So by having the collection name in this list, I can look and see like, okay, obviously this one gets bumped, the Ada rodeo panos gets bumped down the list because it's a rodeo. We don't, we're good on the rodeo. We could do something different. Um, I know Leonard Stroud is a rodeo person, so those got bumped down the list. And alternatively, this unknown here gets bumped up the list because it's a higher chance that it's not a rodeo photograph. So once we've assessed and we've kind of made our priority list of what, what we would prefer to have, you know, conserved first, especially if there are budget issues when doing a project like this, then you want to prepare them for long-term storage and or shipping them off. So all of these directions are on the handout, but I'm going to switch from screen sharing and kind of talk our way through it and hopefully demonstrate live. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Okay, switch back. So again, you want to start with your rolled object. Um, make sure I have the right one here. So first step first, make sure that it is appropriately identified. So you want to, I don't know how clear you can see that, but you want to have uh, an accession number or some sort of ID number on your actual object in pencil, obviously. Um, I like to write mine on the end um, because force of habit, I guess, like we always write our accession numbers on the bottom left corner of the back of an a photograph. Um, so I don't know if this is actually the bottom because I can't unroll it enough to see, but I do tend to stick towards the edge. So after that, our next step is cutting some tissue paper. So when you cut your tissue paper, you want to make sure that it's a little bit bigger than your rolled object itself. Um, you want a little overlap, both in terms of height and in terms of wrapping it, uh, just to kind of prevent any sort of uh, object area from being exposed. So once I've cut my tissue paper, I usually take another pencil and write the object number on the exterior edge of my tissue paper as well. Um, so I don't have to unroll it in order to identify what object I have. Let's see if I can do it without tearing the tissue paper. So you've got the same object number right there. So once you have your object number written, you're going to put that side face down. And then I usually start my rolling at the opposite side to ensure that that edge is the top edge. And then this is where this demonstration is gonna get interesting. Then you're gonna roll it. You want to make sure that your edge stays tucked. Um, and this one is obviously a little too long. And so then, as you can see, that label stayed on the outside. And I've got a little bit of overlap on each end. So once you've got your overlap, um, this is where you have to be a little more delicate. Uh, I usually start a little bit above. If my edge is here, or maybe a half inch above, and kind of fold that edge over. Um, I started doing this to prevent it's twofold. Uh, prevent pieces, your edge to be crumbled. And then if your edge is already crumbling, it, it creates kind of a trap. So say you've got a corner that's starting to tear off and for whatever reason, it gets maybe nudged or you pick it up from that end or something and that edge corner gets completely torn off. Hopefully it will be caught in that fold and you won't lose a piece of your photograph. So carefully do that on both sides. So you've got, you know, a secure, secure tube like this. And then once it's securely wrapped, you're going to take some archival twine and cut a little bit off. Uh, pro tip, always cut your ribbons on an angle there. They fray a little slower that way. And then I usually try to wrap it in the middle, uh, making sure I'm not covering up my number. And you don't want to tie it so tight that it's squeezing. Um, so, but I do like to tie it just in a bow, not in a knot. Um, so like I said, it's not pre putting pressure on the object itself. And it's just a way to keep my tissue paper secure uh, because that stuff does like to come unraveled 
And especially if you're shipping and it's potentially going to be moved, um, it just keeps everything pretty stable. So once we've got this done, let me switch back for a second. Sorry, like I said, we're gonna be jumping a lot. So here's a close up photograph. Um, so you can see a little bit better of what this rolled object should look like. So like I said, I've got my accession number on the exterior of the tissue paper on the top edge. Um, I've got my edge folded over to kind of help protect the edge of the photograph. And I have archival twine tied tightly enough that uh, my paper stays in place, but my photograph is not being squeezed um, on the object. So now that we've got at least our base layer done, uh, we're gonna go into the actual storage container for our rolled panos. Um, so first things first, you want to check the width of your tubes. Uh, I ran into this several times where I thought my tube was wide enough, but turns out the, the edge of the tube itself was thicker than I expected. And so just because it was wide enough according to the the like measurements doesn't mean the interior of the tube was wide enough. Um, so I always double check. After that, um, once you've concerned your tube is wide enough, uh, if necessary, you might need to cut them down. So you can kind of see here, I've got like a raw edge basically because we had two and three foot tubes uh, that we didn't, we needed like, six to 12 inch tubes. Um, but we were just working with what we had on site. So fortunately we have a carpentry shop on, on site so we could get our carpenter to help us cut them down to the necessary length. So when it comes to necessary length, uh, you want it to be slightly longer than your actual panoramic photograph. So that way you're not like pushing up on the ends and potentially damaging your object. So if you have an eight inch photograph, I would say you need somewhere between and a nine to 10 inch tube. Uh, I usually add one to two inches just so there's some, some give. Uh, so once we had them all cut down, we then assembled our tubes. So sometimes we were able to reuse the, um, the plastic caps that come with mailing tubes. Uh, I always put those on the bottom just because they're a more stable uh, support if you're going to, especially if you're going to be storing them upright. Uh, this one didn't obviously, so I had to make my own and I had to make my own for the top as well. Um, so this is where we get into our arts and crafts portion of packing these. When I did it, I was sitting in the floor of our reading room at the coffee table and I had like an assembly line going. Uh, so the arts and craft joke kind of got born out of that, but you're going to be making something that looks like this. So what you wanna do is you'll take a uh, printer paper because it's usually archival quality and you will trace your tube like that. You want to leave, make sure you're not doing it right at the corner because you're actually going to cut your circle slightly larger than the circle you traced. So as you can see here, um, I here is my actual tube and I cut it about an inch larger than the circle I traced. Um, there's a reason for that. And that is to make it fit properly. So after you cut your circle out, cut it out a little, about an inch wider. It doesn't have to be perfect. I just, whatever. Uh, then you're gonna cut flaps. So I kept them about three quarters of an inch, an inch wide. And you cut them from the edge of the paper all the way up to the line you drew. So you have like a lion's mane going all the way around your circle. And that's so it will fit properly later. Um, once you have your paper caps cut, uh, if you need one on the bottom, put one on the bottom with a rubber band and the flaps, make sure that it fits snugly. So let me find a spare rubber band here. You're gonna wanna, I basically just kind of fold it over and then Hold it down with one hand, pull the rubber band off your hand, try not to snap your fingers within it. Um, and then the flaps help it fit more securely. But before you do your top one, you're gonna wanna label it. Um, as previously established, I'm all about the layers of labeling. 
So that way, if your object ever gets separated from its housing, it's easy to put them back together. So what you want to do is it's much like labeling our tissue paper. Um, you're going to label it on the opposite side that you actually put on the object. So for example, let's say this one that I just rolled, my accession number is R.241.299. Have that labeled now on the top of my uh, lid. So then I do the same thing, put it on, smooth it over, put the rubber band on. And I know now if I were to say store this in a box or ship it off to be conserved in a box, as soon as they open the box, they know exactly what objects are in that box because you can see all on the top of the label. Now, as an added precaution, again, I love to label things. I would add an additional labeling of that accession number to the body of the tube. And I usually do it twice on opposite sides. So that way, if it gets turned, um, it's still visible somewhere. I would also put directional arrows so that people are reminded, hey, keep these upright. Don't move them around a lot. Like there is a potentially fragile object in here and we wanna be as mindful with our handling as possible. Okay, so any questions so far about storage or anything like that? Just gonna, I feel like I'm flying through and I wanna make sure everybody's keeping up. I'll wait a second for in case anyone's typing in the chat. Good. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint then. Now, once you have your objects in the tubes, um, if you're not immediately sending them off for conservation like we did, those tubes do, do help create a better storage situation. Um, prior to our rolled panos being in tubes, we had them stored in a number of places, like some were in Hollinger boxes, some were in like big, the big, we call them pizza boxes. Like they're not as deep basically, um, just kind of rolling around in there on top of unrolled objects. Um, there was no rhyme or reason. And now they're all together in one place. They're all securely stored as you can see in the photographs. Um, so the things that are short enough to store upright on a shelf are stored upright. Um, unfortunately, I haven't put them in accession number order yet, but that is on my to-do list for this week um, because I just had to get them unpacked at the time that I stuck them on the shelf. And you can see a little bit in the shelf above and in the other photograph that some of the objects are too tall or too wide to fit in tubes and therefore unable to be stored upright. In those cases, they are stored horizontally, and then I used extra book supports from our library to kind of keep them from rolling around. Um, we have space saver shelving, so the shelves do move, and I didn't want there to be an issue with like one of the shelves gets moved and there's enough momentum for these to roll around and potentially damage an object. So once you've got you know everything packed away in your tubes, your tubes are all labeled multiple times, you're ready to go, either store them or ship them off. Um, so you store the ones you're not shipping, but let's say that maybe you get lucky and your administration budgets for some conservation work or you manage to get a grant or you have a private donor who respects what you're doing and is like, hey, yeah, I'll easily give you 15 grand to do conservation work. Whatever it may be, fingers crossed for all of you and for me, um, you're going to need to outsource most likely, unless you're very lucky and have a conservationist on staff or someone on staff who has those skills, you'll probably need to outsource. So for us, we outsourced to NEDCC, like I said, um, so we had to pack them up to ship. So we figured out the easiest way to ship them is in wine boxes. And that sounds, sounds a little silly, I understand, um, but it actually worked out really well for us. So. Here's a, a photo of from the top of one of those boxes. Um, so you can see the wine boxes are divided. So it gives you, you know, 12 compartments for tubes. 
And for the most part, our tubes all fit comfortably within those little compartments. So you can see four tubes easily here, right? And then, um, then we have these nice, you know, green pockets of uh, bubble wrap. Uh, do I ever use, sorry, I just saw the chat. Do I ever use Tyvek for the ends? Uh, I have not, but it is a possibility. Uh, I mostly had to make do with what packing supplies we have on site, and I couldn't get a hold of any in the time frame I was doing this. But I will make a note of that for if I have to do this again. So we packed our tubes in these compartments, and then, you know, some of our tubes are only six, seven inches high, and the box is much taller. So to prevent any movement, we cut strips of bubble wrap um, and either folded the bubble wrap on top of the, the tube to kind of like create a pad it, padding on top, or if the tube was really narrow, wrap the tube itself in bubble wrap to prevent it from wiggling around and moving. So once we had the box fully packed, um, we actually printed off all those individual sheets from our original assessment inventory and put it in each box. So that way, um, whenever people at the NEDCC open the box, and if you saw this, you might assume that there's not anything underneath that bubble wrap. Like maybe it was just put in there to stabilize the box overall. So that way they know that, you know, this box contains this number of tubes, like this is what should be in it. Um, like double check that the numbers match up. And thankfully when they returned it, they returned those inventories to us. So I was able to confirm that not only were the, the ones that we didn't get unrolled in the correct box, but I also could run that inventory against the uh, flattened objects that I had already gotten back and making sure that like, yes, I have in one way or another received every object that I've sent out for conservation and nothing disappeared on me. Uh, which was a concern of mine at one point. So that's sending it out. Um, so my next slide, I actually is not in the handout I sent earlier, and I apologize for that. But after uh, Patrick shared some of your answers to the question of like, what are you hoping to get out of this? So I thought I would give y'all a glimpse of how they were returned to us from the NEDCC. Um, so they, they returned it to us in a flat shipping box. It was in um, like archival quality, not cardboard, but basically cardboard uh, folders. Within that, it was in a mylar sleeve. And they had, we had four folders based on the uh, final length of the unrolled object because I think our biggest one clocked in at like 5'11", maybe? I don't know, maybe 5'6". Um, and our smallest one was like two and a half feet. So the box was taller than I was. Uh, so it was a little pain to move, but it was probably some of the most stable shipping I've ever seen. And I super appreciate that from them. But they also sent us a disc with before and after images of every object they unrolled. So as you can see, here's the before image for H614 uh, was the accession number. You can spot it right there. And then you can see the after effects. And they shot both the uh, photograph side and the back of the photograph in both like exposed lighting and natural lighting. So you could see any sort of discoloration, any sort of um, stabilization work they might have done. We had a couple where they were missing corners. So they stabilized the corners and did a little in painting to make it look like a smooth transition over that lost edge. Um, and we really got lucky with our prioritization and the way we uh, approached it. As you can see, this is not a rodeo photograph. So it was very exciting for us to, to get these non-rodeo photographs finally unrolled and explored. Um, so that is that in a nutshell. Uh, I feel like I went a little quickly. So I guess now is the time for if you have any questions that you're comfortable being recorded about the packing process. Now is the time to ask them. And 
I've got the chat pulled up if you want to drop it in there or feel free to ask your question live if you're comfortable. Yes, I will show the spreadsheet. Let me switch screen sharing. Okay, so you should be able to, there it is. So as you can see, this is my master list with all of my boxes. Um, anything that's labeled an FIC is a found in collection object that we could not a certain any related accession number or collection information. So we assign them numbers uh, based on, I think we had five or six boxes, like unlabeled boxes we found rolled objects in. So we assigned them based on what box it was in and then what object it was within that box. So like 1.2 is the first box we found, second object we pulled out. Um, and then I have my height here. And then I um, split it so each box has its individual list as well. Um, and the, this page is what I printed off and packed inside each box that got mailed and then was included in what was mailed back to me. Um, I will say as well that let me find it. I do have a master spreadsheet of all of our panoramic photographs that I've been working on building because we had no master list at the time we started doing this. Um, and I'm working to make notes in that that says like, this object was out for conservation. Um, this object has been conserved. Here's the former location. Here's the current location, that sort of thing. So we can track like it's not in the box it's supposed to be in. Oh, it got flattened, so it's it can't it won't fit in that box anymore. Um, I will discuss the overall cost uh, after we stop recording because um, I don't necessarily want that to be totally publicly visible. Um, so, any other questions that anyone might have? Oh, I will add, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, a benefit of using the wine boxes is that those dividers are removable. So on the off chance that you have an object that is like too wide for a tube, you can pack it with a layer of ethafoam, remove one of the dividers and kind of make a custom enclosure within your box for your oversized big roll, uh, basically. I would use archival tubes if you could, if you have them. Um, unfortunately, we did not have them and we did not have the budget to order them at the time. Uh, so we had to make do with mailing tubes, but we did kind of run checks on like the acid output um, and the off gassing on those uh, and tried to get ones through our our mailroom uh, that were slightly more stable than other brands. Okay, Patrick, if you wanna start, stop the recording, I will answer that last question. Um, and we still have plenty of time. I just figured I would, we could stop it now and then, is there any yeah. other questions? 